A special thanks to these companies for being long-term partners of this channel. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Zach. Here we talk about overlanding, gear builds, DIY, all sorts of stuff related to modifying your vehicle and just getting out there in the outdoors using maybe trucks or SUVs. And uh, today we're talking a little bit more about suspension. I know I keep talking about it, um, but it's just really important and it can be critical to how comfortable your rig is off-road. And so uh, today I just wanna talk more about why Dobbins' suspension is so unique and also just show you some of the components that make up suspension. Maybe you're curious on how many suspensions work or you just wanna see what the insides look like. So. So thanks for supporting the channel. If you like what I'm doing, consider subscribing and consider liking this video if it brings you any sort of value or you learn anything new because that helps me, helps me be able to continue to grow this channel. So let's jump right into uh, looking at these components and just talking a little bit more about the suspension. This is the front suspension. So this is the strut and shock assembly or spring and shock assembly that people would call a strut. And I've gotten to the point where I always pay for the assembly because this is a pain in the neck to sometimes do yourself. I'm not even talking about using spring compressors with a pneumatic drill where you compress the sides. The problem I ran into when doing this with my old man emu kit was these springs are quite small and the spacing between them is pretty small as well. So almost all the spring kits that I could use to compress them weren't small enough to compress the amount of weight that some of these springs have. So having an industrial hydraulic spring compressor is the safest way to do this, but also I think sometimes the only way to do it depending upon your situation. So I always just recommend get the professional install. It saves you a lot of time when you're doing the suspension install if you're doing it in your driveway and it's also just safer. And in a way it's almost not even doable for some people. So that's what I recommend. This is the assembly. I just wanna kind of go into some of the different components. So one of the first things to note is most suspension systems don't have this adjustable connection on the reservoir. So that's what's really awesome about Dobinson's is Dobinson's has this specific style that allows you to rotate on the hose and it allows you to pivot like this. So you can adjust this location of your remote reservoir in so many different ways that a lot of companies don't. Like I think Fox and King both have fixed 90 degree fittings here and sometimes you can purchase different fittings, but a lot of times they're fixed, whereas this one is adjustable. So that's really handy if you're trying to mount this in a specific location that's not the standard stock location to mount it. So, and then if we look at this, this is where our low and high speed compression is. Now, when they talk about low and high speed compression, this refers to how fast you compress the shock. This is not referring to how fast you're driving because you could be going quite slow and hit something really hard and it would compress it fast. They're kind of correlated speed of the vehicle to the speed of the compression, but this is what it's kind of referring to. So if you're hitting something really hard, really fast, that's going to be a high speed compression because it's gonna really shove it in faster. Whereas if you're just hitting like slow bumps like this, then that is gonna be more low speed compression. Now, the thing that I was learning was when you're setting these, both of them kind of depend on each other. Now, companies try to make them be entirely independent, but it's kind of hard to do. So if we look at this disassembled, uh, shock reservoir here. This is just your typical type of screw. So if you turn the bottom or the top, sometimes it will have a turning effect on the low speed compression. Now Dobinson's has done a good job of, for the most part, not causing this to be an issue, but most people recommend in the instructions, I believe as well, is you should set your high speed compression before you set your low speed compression. That's just what I was understanding. And so you may be wondering, well, what on earth does this even do? Well, what low speed and high speed compression do, as far as I understand, is they control the restriction of the flow of fluid. So if you're hitting a like really high speed compression and your shock is compressing really fast, if you want it to be a softer ride, you want the fluid in your shock to push out really fast or at least be displaced within the shock. And so if you have 
a you know less restrictive valve allowing that fluid to push out quicker that means with your high speed compression it's probably going to be a softer ride because it's going to be much easier for the shock body to move along this shaft now if you have it turned up to where your high speed compression is a lot more restrictive and harder for your sh your strut to push in this is going to give you a much stiffer ride it's going to allow you to you reduce most body roll but you're also going to feel it in your ride quality so that's how i like to think about it is when you're setting your high and low speed compressions you want to think about what types of obstacles you're going to be hitting and how comfortable of a ride you want because this is a way where you can really adjust that and fine tune it and another reason people really like this is if you're doing lots of different types of terrain, you can set this every time that you want to do that specific terrain. So, and then when you turn these, it's kind of hard to see, and I don't even know if you can always see it, but when you turn them, it's adjusting something inside those valves down there. So, pretty interesting, pretty cool. So, and then these two components right here, this is more just uh, understanding the construction of this remote reservoir. But if we look at the stock one here that's already assembled, this is our end cap. And under this little plastic cover is a port. So they put nitrogen gas inside these components because that is what they do to kind of create the pressure gradients they need. Now, this here is something that you do not want to like open or heat or whatever. They've got this warning thing here. Don't touch that because it's not something you adjust personally but this is something that they use to set up the shock as well as if they're going to rebuild the shock, they will probably use that gas port. But otherwise, this little screw on cap just goes over that port and you don't really need to worry about ever messing with that. And so that's what these components are right here. This is a fluid divider between the fluid in your cavity and the gas in the cavity. So this pushes in and then there is going to be an additional space where this pushes on top of it and then there's a space of gas inside the reservoir and then there's a space of fluid inside this reservoir that will flow through the tube and into your other shock body i'm not quite sure if it's possible even to make a re adjustable system without having a remote reservoir because you may need this extra volume for fluid to be displaced in order to have those large swings in adjustable compression so I, uh, that was kind of a lot of jargon but to just kind of unpack what i meant by that is if you want to take uh, your shock and make it a really soft ride that means that your fluid needs to be moved in an easier manner and that's as far as i understand it and so i think with having much less volume and just having let's say this shock and not having this additional fluid space in the remote reservoir it may be really difficult to even make a only shock adjustable system. You may need to have the remote reservoir for that extra space. And there's also other benefits to having the remote reservoir. If you're compressing your shock a lot, that's going to heat up the fluid inside of your shock, which if you heat up a system, that will change the viscosity of your fluid. So your viscosity refers to basically how thick a fluid is. So water versus honey they have very different viscosities and so if you heat up a fluid that's going to reduce its viscosity and make it more fluid like so in when you have a system like this where you're moving fluid around inside of the shock body if your fluids characteristics really change that's going to drastically change the performance of your shock so you want your fluids to stay within your design so that whether you're driving frequently or you're driving on really hard terrain, you're not gonna all of a sudden see your shock performance change drastically from what you've designed. And so the remote reservoir is another way where you can cycle fluid and keep that fluid temperature reduced. So now this is where I'm gonna kind of turn to the rear suspension instead of the front suspension on the Forerunner because I think it's a little bit easier to use to explain this shaft. Um, but I do just want to mention that these are three-way adjustable. So most systems are only two-way adjustable. This is three-way. And the way this is three-way is if you look at the end of this shock, it's going to be impossible to get it in focus. Let's see if we can get it in focus. 
there is a little adjustment on the inside of that thread and that is for adjusting your rebound. So what rebound is, is when you think about a shock, you have compression and then you have rebound. And so what you can do is you can have your shock rebound very slowly and then you can have your shock rebound very quickly. And this is adjustable, but I would say you need to do this with an asterisk because you can adjust your rebound, but it's going to dramatically change how your vehicle performs. And so if you have too much rebound, it can be incredibly stiff and potentially hard on the shock, as far as I've understood. So making your rebound really abrupt can sometimes A, really increase the like stiffness of your ride, which may or may not be helpful. Um, it also may kind of change how your vehicle gets traction on the road. And then similarly, if it's not a really, you know, abrupt rebound, but it's a slower rebound, then that can cause issues as far as having your wheel actually get ground contact when you're hitting bumps. Because think about it, if you hit a bump and your tire pushes up and then it takes a slow, slow amount of time for your wheel to come back down, your car has already gone over the bump and come back down. So you need your tire to push back down and actually hit the ground. And if it's not gonna push down and actually hit the ground, then you're gonna start having traction issues because you're like, come on suspension, get my tires over this bump in a comfortable way and back down to the ground so I can actually get traction. Otherwise, this is gonna start to be unsafe. So that's where you just have to be smart about setting your rebound and it's not necessarily a sketchy sort of adjustment. It just, it, it's important that you understand the implications of turning up your rebound and turning down your rebound. So on this front suspension, that's how you adjust your, your rebound is on the top of this screw. I'm gonna now switch over to the rear suspension and just explain to you slash show you how the rebound is adjusted on there. So this is another classic situation where my shock won't fit in the uh, frame at all, but these are their extended length rear shocks. So they're quite long. They're not a long travel kit per se, but they do have quite a bit of travel, about the most you can get without you know doing a long travel kit. And this is your rebound. So I don't know if R stands for rear, but I don't think it does. It just stands for rebound. And uh, so you turn this screw for the positive or the negative to adjust your rebound up and down. So here is the uh, actual shock body for the rear. Because the rear is a solid axle on four runners, it doesn't have the independent suspension sort of shock strut assembly like the front suspension does. And so this is the remote reservoir for the rear. We have this tube here. Apparently on the newer ones, they have a longer tube because this allows you to mount your remote reservoir in more places. Um, but I got a short tube version. It's not necessarily good or bad. It's just uh, I'm gonna be a little more restricted to where I mount my reservoir. I think this is changing though to where you'll always get a longer tube version when you're installing uh, the newer systems from Dobinson's. So a lot of like wheels have the dual speed compression adjustment. So this is where your high and low speed compression adjusters are. They are these two knobs on the shock reservoir. To turn them right tightens them and then to turn them left loosens them. So basically to tighten them means to make it stiffer, to loosen them means to loosen it up. And then the adjustability on the rebound is this little teeny turning knob at the very top of the shock body. So that's how you adjust these. Let's jump back to the rear and I'll show you how I adjust them. So the rear is a little more challenging to show because the older design of these rear MRR shocks has a short tube. Um, the newer ones have a longer tube so you can mount the reservoir somewhere else. These are mounted kind of under the frame in the rear like you see here. So you just have to reach in around the tire and grab those two to adjust those. In order to adjust the rebound, there's a little screw at the bottom of the shock tower that you turn. It's like a flathead screwdriver and you can adjust it. I want to take a quick minute to thank the sponsor of today's video, Onyx Off-Road. You can go and save yourself 20% on an Onyx Off-Road subscription if you use my code on the screen here down below. So thank you Onyx Off-Road for sponsoring this video. Let's just jump right in. I want to show you a few of the features, especially on the desktop, that allow you to you know, plan out trips and trails ahead of time so that you're not sitting out on the trail and wondering where to go. 
So let's jump right in. Uh, right here, I'm looking at Minnesota. That's where I am from. And we're trying to figure out some trails to go on. What we can do is we can come up here to the filter and we can choose whatever activity we're doing. So Onyx Off-Road is not just for four runners or you know off-road four by four vehicles. You can use it for dirt biking, four wheeling, snowmobiling, Jeep, you know, driving a Jeep, driving full size, whatever you want. You can basically anything you can off-road, they've got maps for on here. So, you know, if we go to dirt biking or if we just go to all types, it'll start showing all these trails. And it's pretty sweet because we can check out these different blue marks on the screens, which show that a trail guide has added some extra information. So here we've got some sweet photos of this Jeep going through a gnarly mud puddle. Super awesome. Uh, and then if you look around also, we have some different areas like Paul Bunyan State Forest. This is an area I grew up dirt biking and they've got all the trails mapped on here as well. So a lot of different options. You can kind of check everything out and surf it around. I really like it too, because if you're not just looking for in the state you live in, you can start going out to say Colorado or Utah and really start filtering in on all the different types of trails that are out here and all this information. I mean, it, it's endless. You could spend hours on here reading all this stuff. So super helpful for looking around in your state where you don't want to look at government maps or try and like sift through old websites of information. Onyx Off-Road has got it all in one place and they've got a lot of information here and it's growing daily because there's trail guides out there right now as we speak mapping more trails and also adding in helpful data for you to set up your next trip. So thanks again Onyx Off-Road for sponsoring this video and thank you all for supporting me. If you want to use my code for 20% off, it'll be linked down in the description below and I'll also pop it up on the screen. So thank you very much. Let's jump right back into the video. So up front, I like to run the suspension a little bit on the stiffer side. So my high speed and my low speed compression are set to the tightest setting they'll go. They're turned all the way to the right. And then my rebound is set a couple clicks away from the maximum. I just like this because I like to take exit ramps or on ramps quickly, you know, 55, 60 miles an hour, and I don't really like to have any body roll. So uh, that's why I've set it so stiff. I'm, I'm just, my old system, my old main EMU system was on the stiffer side and I really liked actually how that was so responsive and allowed me to drive the vehicle in a little more of an aggressive way or not a, necessarily in like a bad aggressive way, but just it's very responsive. And so uh, I've liked to set this a little bit on the stiffer side driving around town. When I'm off road, I actually really will turn it down quite soft. It's nice because it'll really articulate nice and it's a lot more comfortable and cushy. Driving around town, you could definitely set it more in the middle area and it would still be totally safe and fine. Uh, I just like the stiffer ride because of my driving style compared to having it super soft. When I first got uh, the suspension installed, uh, I drove around with it super soft in town for a while and, it, and it's fine. It just feels a little squirrely and it was super cushy, but I just like it to be a little bit more responsive. So the, uh, those are kind of my settings for up front. Let's jump in the rear and I'll talk about those. So in the rear, it's kind of similar to the same as in the front. I think my rebound isn't set quite as aggressively in the front just because I didn't think it was probably necessary for like steering purposes. Uh, but the rebound I think is like four or five clicks away or maybe it's right in the middle. And then my dual speed compression settings, the high and low speed, they're both set to being May, almost the stiffest they can go. I think it's maybe three or four clicks away from the stiffest they can go. So like I said though, this stuff you can super easily tune. I like to adjust it when I'm at the gas station. It's really convenient. So it's not necessarily a big deal to adjust them. I know a lot of people say, will I ever get out and adjust them? And you know, I don't know, that's a good question. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. That's gonna be depending upon the person, but I don't really think it's too hard to adjust them. So. I will do it if I feel like the ride quality, I just want a little bit of tweaking in. Um, but other than that, I've really liked this whole rear setup. Having the adjustability in the arms is gonna be really nice if I ever go bigger than 34s. It's also just a heavier duty setup than the stock configuration. So having all those adjustable bars is really nice. Plus the adjustable pan hard bar allows me to kind of slightly tweak uh, the alignment of the rear axle, which I've really liked. So. Now, I've had this system installed for about five or six months now, and 
it's just been a great system. I can't really complain at all about anything I can think of. Um, you know, the kit is really economical for what you're getting. It's rebuildable, but the rebuild period isn't defined. So if you aren't an aggressive driver or you just aren't very hard on your things, then maybe they'll last a lot longer than other systems. Um, I also think their price is really like not necessarily a bad price. It's a pretty good price point. And for consumer level, it's you know readily available. I, overall, I'm just I've been really happy with this system. So that's kind of my thoughts. Uh, I haven't had anything break. Everything, nothing squeaks. Uh, it's just been awesome. So and I've, I've had it six or so months. I've daily driven it. I've taken it off road. Uh, it's just been great. So no complaints. And in the rear, in the front, those are kind of the settings I've been running with. But you're gonna have to tune them into how you like because probably what I do isn't gonna be slightly what you all will like. I do find that setting everything to the stiffest still isn't super, super uncomfortable. So don't expect that if you turn them all the way to the stiff setting, it's just gonna be unbearable like you're driving without suspension. So yeah, those are my thoughts. So that's a wrap for the video. Comment down below what you think about this suspension. I just love the Dobinson suspension system. I think it's a pretty affordable kit for everything you're getting. The rebuild time is not determined, so if you're easier on your suspension or you don't off-road as much, then maybe these will last you like twice as long as some of the other you know versions on the market that require a quicker rebuild period. I also think they're just a good product. Like they're they're built well. They seem to withstand a lot of different environments. And so far they've been performing really well for me. So I've been overall super excited about them. And they sell a bunch of other different kits too that are you know maybe based on similar technology or at least have a similar R&D department managing those designs. So, so you can typically have some confidence in their entire product line if they have a really good top of the line product because that means that all their engineers are probably thinking in a similar vein in trying to design good products across the price spectrum. So the other thing I will say is, is I've heard incredible things about their IMS system. So if you're someone who doesn't off-road a lot or you're not doing high speed driving, the remote reservoirs maybe not maybe are not really that necessary for you for cooling down your shock fluid. And it may just be better for you to get the IMS kit, save some money there and go snag some other modifications that are gonna help you out like a tent or bigger tires or some sort of camping gear. Who knows, there's lots of other fun stuff you can buy for your vehicle. So those are kind of just my thoughts. Thank you so much for checking in on this video. And if it brought you any sort of value, consider liking, consider subscribing to the channel if you like what I'm doing. I try to provide value as often as I can and I appreciate all of your support. Thanks again Onyx Off-Road for sponsoring this video and I will catch you all in the next video.